Well, we're making it through 1 Timothy, and we're all the way up to 1 Timothy chapter 5. I really enjoy Thursday nights because we can go kind of verse by verse in context, and uh, it's, really, it's really refreshing. Sundays, we're always teaching topically, and so this is um, it's a real blessing just to see the scriptures in context, isn't it? Can't you just imagine how the excitement, if you were a church or if you were a pastor like Timothy and you receive this epistle and the epistle gets read before all the people and they're just clinging to every word. They didn't have the New Testament like we have it today. This was their New Testament. But here in 1 Timothy chapter 5, starting at verse 1, he says, Do not sharply rebuke an older man, but rather appeal to him as a father to the younger men as brothers. And you see there that word sharply rebuke, it means to strike upon, to beat upon, to chastise with words. How many of you have ever come out of a church meeting and maybe you didn't have bruises, but you sure did take some blows and you felt like someone struck you verbally? And that's not to be in church. As long as I have anything to do with it, it will never happen here. There's a way to correct, and it doesn't have to be with harshness and intimidation and condemnation. You can rebuke, and you can actually correct very gently by the Spirit of God, and we're going to see that here. But he says, do not sharply rebuke an older man, but rather appeal to him as a father. And I want you to see what Paul is doing here to the younger men as brothers, the older women as what? Mothers and the younger women as sisters in all purity. And we talked, oh, maybe a month ago about that purity aspect, so I won't get into that again, but I want you to see in verses 1 and 2, he's likening how we interact as a church to a natural family. You all see that? Why, why would he be doing that? I think, number one, he's doing it because... He wants to stress the level of commitment and loyalty we should have for our brothers and sisters in Christ. In so many ways, blood is thicker than water. There's just some wonderful dynamics about a family. Maybe you can relate to this, you know. Maybe sometime you and your brother are out and you say, yeah, this is my brother. Can't stand him. He drives me crazy. But if you try to hurt him, I'll kill you. Right? You all know that dynamic that's at work? And that's what he's talking about with, a, with the commitment and the loyalty. In a family, sometimes we take uh, their love for granted because there's that understanding that we're family. That's, this is all the family we've got. We've got to take care of each other. And you've got to love me because I'm your brother. Right? And so there's not that, you know, in the family dynamics, if the family is healthy, and the relationships are healthy, there's no fear of rejection, and there's no fear of abandonment. Sure, you might fight every now and then like cats and dogs, and you might speak very directly into each other's life, but the whole concern of being rejected by that person is not there. And that's what he's talking about here when he wants us to get to this place of treating each other as a family unit. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to stick by your side. I'm not going to leave you. I'm committed to you. And that needs to be clearly understood. Notice, you know, he's saying here, don't sharply rebuke, but appeal. That word appeal is a word we know very much. That's the same word for uh, exhortation, to encourage, to call to one side in a very personal way, to minister to them, to nurture them to nurture the relationship. And so he's saying that you should never have to treat anybody harshly in the body of Christ, but instead you should exhort them, encourage them. If if there's something that needs to be spoken to, it's done in a very loving and committed way. I put there, correction must always be given in the context of love, commitment, and loyalty. So when you're speaking to someone and bringing correction, your commitment to them must be obvious. And that comes over time 
with consistency in the relationship. I put there correct in such a way that the correction will not be misconstrued as an insult or a rejection. Husbands, wives, how do you do with conflict resolution in the home? Hopefully it's not the one who can scream the loudest. Hopefully it's not the one who pouts and walks out the door. You know, with practice and, and by the Spirit of Christ, have you been able to come to the place where you can actually talk things out and come to a peaceable understanding? The more the other person is convinced of your love for them, the more receptive and teachable they will be. What causes the walls to go up, what causes the paranoia to set in, is because they're bracing, thinking, oh no, I'm about to be rejected. Or, oh no, I'm about to be condemned. Or, oh no, I'm about to get a guilt trip laid on me. When it's, when it's done with a spirit of criticism, condemnation, the walls go up, they freeze, you're not really going to get anywhere with the particular issue. But if you are convinced that they love you and they're not going to abandon you, you're much more willing to listen and to open up your heart. Correction must be given and received in the knowledge that you would do whatever it takes to help. You don't just rebuke someone and then walk off and let them struggle on their own. You're there, you pray with them, you seek God with them, you... You share with them what God has done in your life and how he's helped you through similar situations. And lastly, we must learn and practice speaking the truth and love. Truth is what you say, and love is how you say it. Always. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8 speaks to this. When he says, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. What does it mean that love covers a multitude of sins? I put there just as a note, in a church family, we're not surprised by sin. Sin will occur, but we don't let the sin remain, and we don't let the sin divide us. And that is this commitment of being a family, where you love your brother, you love your sister, you love your mom, you love your dad, even with all of the flaws. And you're committed. You're not going to abandon or walk out on the relationship just because a crack showed up in their character. So when we say love covers a multitude of sins, we don't allow the sin to stay. The sin has to be purged, right? The leaven has to be purged out. It has, the sin has to be corrected, but what we're saying is we're going to hang together on this. What was meant to destroy and divide, we're not going to let it do that. We're going to stay committed to each other, love one another, pray for one another, and we're going to see this sin driven out. But we're not abandoning you. We, we don't leave anybody behind. We're not going to let it divide us. Galatians chapter 6 and <clears throat> 2 Timothy, again, talk about the way that it's done. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 talks about a believer. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 could, could be talking about someone right here in this room, one of the faithful, one, a member of the family. Brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of what? Gentleness, not harshly. Each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. And, you know, I always used to read this verse and I was thinking, what, what is he talking about? I wonder what he's talking about. What would I be tempted by? Well, you know, if someone's caught up in, in maybe um, some sin, you might be tempted to commit that same sin. It could, that could be the explanation. But the more I've meditated on this passage, I really believe the temptation that he's war war warning against is found in verses 2 through 4. He says this, Bear one another's burdens, and thereby fulfill the law of Christ, for if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself, but each one must examine his own work, and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to what? Another. So this is what he's describing here. Uh, Sal sees me commit a sin. 
and it's something that seems to be recurring, not going away. He needs to come speak to me about it. And then Sal ends up being tempted in his own mind to think, well, I'm better than Richard. At least I don't do that. And you begin comparing yourself to each other, and Sal starts now to boast in himself, but it's a boasting in regard to me. Well, I'm better than that. I would never dream of doing something like that. Yeah, well, Sal has his own list, but we won't get into that right now. But that's, this is what he's talking about here, when, you know, if Sal, God forbid, would start to think that he's something because he sees my flaws and can correct me. You know, you, you kind of feel a little superior when you can jack someone up, right? And so he's saying, don't fall into this temptation when you go to correct. It's always got to be in that spirit of gentleness. And then 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24, the reason why I put both of these in here, Galatians 6 is talking about one of us in this room, right? 2 Timothy chapter 2, I believe the scope goes out a little further when he says in verse 24, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome. All right, so as, as people of God, as men and women of God, we don't get into arguments and debates. We don't have to prove that we're right. We don't have to win. So don't be quarrelsome, but be kind to who? Kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged. That patient when wrong is, is the hardest thing up there, quite frankly. You know when someone criticizes you or someone hurts you or wounds you or offends you or breaks your heart, for you to respond in love is, is supernatural. And then look at verse 25, the same word with what? With gentleness correcting those who are in opposition. Now when someone is coming against you and opposing you, are you able to respond to them in gentleness? Or do you want to give them one right upside the head and get even? To be able to respond in gentleness and love to someone who's opposing you, to someone who is wronging you, being wrong to you, to someone who's wanting to quarrel and debate and prove that they're right, to respond in gentleness is supernatural. Contrary to our human nature, but thank God we have Christ living inside of us. And so he gives us the power to respond this way. All right, so uh, first couple of verses of 1 Timothy 5 talk about how to, re how to respond to one another as a family. And then he goes on in verse 3, and we get into a whole other topic. All right, so in your mind, get ready to switch gears here. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 3. He says, honor widows who are widows indeed. That word honor, you'll see there, it means to fix value upon, and it is the same word honor as in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, just a few verses down, 14 verses down to be exact, where he says the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor. So it's the same word. And verse 17 is obviously talking about compensation, and so he's talking about the same thing, and it's much more than just compensation. It's much more than just a paycheck. In verse 17, he's talking about the respect and the honor that comes along with the position, that comes with the paycheck, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. And so just comparing the way this word honor is being used by Paul Verse 3, when he says, honor widows who are widows indeed, we understand he's, he's talking about providing for them financially, taking care of them. Because especially in this day, you know, nowadays things are a little bit different when women go out and get jobs and have careers. But back in these days, the women were really dependent on a man. So when he's saying here, honor widows who are widows indeed, he's talking about subsistence living, taking care of their needs. And notice he says, honor widows who are widows what? Indeed. So he's implying here that there's some widows you would give to and some widows who you would not give to. 
And so what he's saying is, discern within your own selves who the true widows are and not those who are just pretending or falsifying to use the system to get money. And so he's talking here specifically about widows, but I want to open up the subject a little wider and just talk about giving to the poor. I think that's what I titled it. Because the widows here, providing for the widows is really just a subset of giving to the poor. And I just want to give you some things to think about tonight. And again, you know, I recognize that I'm preaching to the choir. You guys have done a fantastic job. In the last month, not only did we meet our income that we need, but we also provided benevolence to four different homes, families in the fellowship. Isn't that good? And when we provide that, when we provide that benevolence, what we're providing for are things like, uh, I won't mention any names, but someone's heat stayed on, didn't get turned off. That's pretty important this time of year. Uh, someone else's rent was paid, and they got caught up on their rent. And so things like that, critically important for us as the church, because I want you to see here, Several of these verses, I, I put it in a big gray box, but number one, I want you, we're going to operate off of two premises. One, God commands us to be generous towards the poor and ready to give. And then secondly, God expects us to use discretion in our giving to those in need. Widows indeed is what he said. We come up with a lot of excuses not to give, right? In, uh, in just in my own life, I remember probably, uh, I don't know how long, probably close to 30 years, if we would go downtown and pass a homeless person, I used all three of these excuses that we're about to talk about here for a moment. And it, it hasn't been until just like the past six, seven, eight years that I, I really can't pass those people buy anymore. I remember Terry and I were up in Baltimore in the inner city, and it was a really crowded city street. It was a six-lane divided highway, you know, going right through the middle of town, and we had to cross over at this uh, crosswalk, and uh, it had a median strip, a pretty wide median strip in the middle, three lanes on each side going opposite directions, and there was this guy sitting there, uh, Indian style, and we were in this huge, well, not huge, we were in this big crowd of people. And you know what, how it is in the city, on the streets, when you're just, you know, you're just kind of like going in a pack, you know, but kind of being carried along with the crowd. And so we had to make it across the first three lanes first, dodging cars and pushing and shoving back with the crowd around us. And as we went over this median strip, there was this guy sitting there and I looked into his eyes, and I have never seen such despair and misery. The guy just, it was just heartbreaking. And so we go by, and then we kind of dodge cars over the next three lanes. And when I got over there, uh, it was interesting. Terry had seen the exact same thing. I just said, wait here. I've got to go back. I can't leave him. And she said, yeah, go. She had seen that same, I can't even describe to you the look in his eyes. I, and it was like someone grabbed, reached inside my chest and grabbed my heart, and I just, and so I walked, uh, and again, I'm, now I'm fighting back through the crowds of people and dodging cars to get back to them. And I can't even remember, I know I said a few words to him. You can imagine, in that type of a situation, it's not really the time or place to have a conversation. But I said something to him, handed him some cash. And you know, it, it really wasn't anything about what I said. It wasn't about the cash. I just desperately wanted him to know that he was seen. He wasn't invisible. Someone saw his desperation and someone cared. And 
I think of James where James says, if you don't do something about the need that you see in your brother, then how dwelleth the love of God in your heart? Can you really just turn away? Now, these are the excuses that we use a lot of time. Sometimes we think, well, that, that's their fault. They brought it on themselves. I remember, and I won't get, go into details. I won't, don't want to take too long, but I can remember Terry and I going through some de desperate times earlier on. And the church at that time made an announcement we're not going to lift one finger to help Richard because he brought this on himself and he needs to feel the pain. And, and I remember uh, Terry's parents drove down from New Jersey three and a half hours and picked us up, took us home, and began to love and care for us. Having, well, let me just say it this way. The church taught me one thing through all of that. And what the church taught me was, I will never again trust my heart, my need, or my failure to them. Never again. But it was family that stood by us and took care of us in a very desperate time. And so going back to those first verses in Timothy 5, verses 1 and 2, when it says... Love as brothers, love as sisters, love as your mother, love as, as if it's your father. He's stressing that commitment to where a friend loveth at all times. The good and the bad, the successes and the failures. And I will not leave your side until we pray through this. You know, when we say it's their fault, they brought it on themselves... They're probably some dope addict or some alcoholic. Or Can you just think for a moment, did God do that to you? You know, sometimes we think, well, if I care or give to them, they'll just go out and do it again. That's like saying to Paul Jester, God looks down at Paul Jester and says, I'm not going to forgive Paul Jester. He's just going to go out and sin again. How would you like it if God had that reaction to you? We, none of us would be sitting here tonight, would we? I also put there the Christian's greatest qualities, the kindness, the compassion, the generosity. That is what makes us the most vulnerable. And I put there as a follow-up, if you don't like it, then don't be a Christian. But if you want to start being critical and judgmental and put up all of your walls of defenses that you're never hurt again, you can't be a Christian. A Christian loves and forgives. A Christian shows compassion even when they're being wronged. So you better figure out, this is a price I pay as a Christian, and it's well worth it, because that's what Jesus did for me. And then this last one, oh, they're just lazy and want someone to do it for them. Now, the thing is, there could be elements of truth in all three of these excuses. So I am not denying that, and I'm not saying that these three bullet points don't become a factor in certain situations, because they do. You know, the balance to this is that you don't want to enable an addict. You don't want to give them anything that's going to make the sin that they are in bondage to worse. All right, so does, is everybody with me? There's a whole other balance to this. But I'm really talking about our heart attitude. If you think about the parable of the Good Samaritan, man gets beaten up, he's in the ditch. What was first, the priest? The priest walks to the other side of the road. Well, thanks for your help. And then comes a Levite. What does he do? Does the same thing. He walks to the other side. Where is your heart, man? And do you know what? I'm sure that that priest and that Levite had very good reasons, just like these three bullet points. But they didn't go up to the guy in the ditch and say, well, what's your problem? You just lazy, lying there? 
What's your problem? Did you do something wrong? Did you bring this on yourself? Do you notice? He didn't ask one question. What did he do? It says that he was moved with compassion and he started to help. He didn't care what that guy had done. He didn't care what had brought that guy to that point of need. He was going to do something about it. That was God's reaction to us. Remember, I can't remember the chapter, but there in Ezekiel, maybe it was Jeremiah, I can't remember, where he passed by and we were polluted in our own blood and he took us. Which one? Ezekiel 16. And he washed us and clothed us. And then we grow up into something beautiful and take all the credit to ourselves. But our excuses aren't any good. I want you to see these passages. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 7. And I'll try to speed up here. If there is a poor man with you, one of your brothers, in any of your towns and your land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart nor close your hand from your poor brother. Now, an easy cop-out would be to say, well, you know, that guy on the street corner there, he's not my brother, I'm not related to him. Just remember, it was a Samaritan that went and helped the guy beaten up. There wasn't any relation there. But you shall freely open your hand to him and shall generously lend him sufficient for his need in whatever he lacks. Talking about generosity, and one thing that I want you to see here is that providing for the poor is a, uh, a strong biblical theme throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I think we do a great job with the prison ministry, with the visitation ministry, with the street ministry, with being able to provide benevolence this past month. I think uh, God is pleased with our efforts. I would love for that to grow uh, it's kind of always been an unconscious, well, not unconscious, but a dream in the back of my mind. I would love to have some way that we could help people, train people, help them find jobs, get them back on their feet if they're in desperate times. And I, and I think the, you know, the visitation, the prison, and uh, what am I missing? The street ministry are just the seeds for that. I, I'm hoping and praying that it grows more and more into that. He says in verse 9, Beware that there is no base thought in your heart, saying the seventh year, the year of remission, is near. Now remember, he's talking about the year of Jubilee, when all of the debts were uh, forgiven. Which tells you something, this poor man in verse 8, in context, it's talking about him as if he's in debt. How many of you, I'm not helping that guy, he got himself in debt, he got himself into this mess. Why should I take my hard-earned money and get him out of his problem? But he's saying, make sure there's no base thought where you say, hey, the year of Jubilee is just six months away. I think he's got enough fat on his bones to last. He needs something to eat today. He can't wait six months. But you can see here in verse 9, you know, how we rationalize and excuse ourselves. The seventh year, the year of remission is near, and your eye is hostile towards your poor brother, and you give him nothing, that he may cry to the Lord against you, and it will be a sin in you. You shall generously give to him, and your heart shall not be grieved when you give to him. I'll never see that 50 bucks again. That's what it's talking about here. You know, when I go by now on a street like that and, and I give something to some of those people, it, it's such a, it's, it sets you free. It is such a liberty. And after I went back to that median strip, median, yeah, and, and uh, ministered to that man, I was at peace. I could go on. Your heart shall not be grieved when you give to him because for this thing the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all your undertakings. For the poor will never cease to be in the land. Therefore, I command you, saying, you shall freely open your hand to your brother, to your needy, and to the poor in your land. Matthew chapter 5, verse 40. 
Jesus said, if anybody wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you. And do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. Is that hard for you to read? We do need to add a caveat right here. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 8. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be what? We're talking about what does it take to survive? Food, clothing, and shelter. We're not talking about you've got to pay the guy's HBO bill. Let the H He'll be a lot better without HBO. Let it go. We're talking, when we're talking about giving to the poor, we're talking about providing food, clothing, and shelter. All right? We're talking about the necessities of life. We're not talking about cell phones, internet bills, HBO bills, things that you can live without. Matthew chapter 6, verse 2, I just wanted you to see uh, Jesus' assumption here. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you. Verse 3, but when you give to the poor, and you probably noticed it doesn't say if you give to the poor, it says what? So see, throughout the Old Testament, in the mind of Jesus and in, in the mind of the apostles, giving to the poor was a regular part of life. That was Christianity. Matthew chapter 19, verse 21, where Jesus is addressing the rich young ruler, he says, if you wish to be complete, go and do what? Sell your possessions and give to the... Remember Zacchaeus in Luke 19, verse 5? Zacchaeus hurries to Jesus. And Zacchaeus in his repentance says to Jesus, Behold, half of my possessions will I give to the, to the poor. So this benevolence is something that is throughout the scriptures. And then in Galatians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, Paul's describing his interaction with James and Cephas and John. And this is when he went to see them, to talk about the ministry and what was happening and the only thing they added to Paul in ministry was verse 10. They only asked us to remember the poor. The very thing I also was what? Eager to do. When you can reach down and just relieve some of the stress and some of the pain, that is the hand of your heavenly father reaching down out of heaven. That's what father did for you. That's what he did for me when you can bring just a measure of peace. Sure, the $5 bill, the $10 bill isn't going to solve their problems, not even close. But if you can just give them that mercy to where they begin to believe again that there is hope, that someone does love them, and you can do it in the name of Jesus so that they understand this is the God of the Bible reaching out to them, the impact that you can have on that life you'll never understand fully here on this earth. And then in Romans chapter 15, Paul is talking about things that are going on. And he said, For Macedonia and Acacia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. And so we see a couple of different things happening here. One, you can give to the poor privately, personally, on your own, as you become aware of a need in someone's life. And there's times where uh, the church will take up a contribution and make an announcement and say, hey, this is a need and, and we, need to, we need to help these folks out. So it can be either done through the church or it can be done one-on-one. -on -one. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. Charge them that are rich in this world. How many of you, when reading 1 Timothy chapter 6, says, oh, this doesn't apply to me, I'll just skip over this. But, you know, we really have to ask a question. How many of you have something that you don't need to live? If you have something tonight that you don't need to sustain life, you are rich. These rich people, they are to do good, rich in good works, ready to what? Ready to distribute, willing to communicate, 
laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come. This is God's promise in verse 19, that if you will help those that are in hard times, when hard times come to you, your needs will be met. You're laying up in store that good foundation, and you know that what you have sown to others, you will reap from the Lord. So it becomes very, a very important principle to live by. Now he goes on in 1 Timothy chapter 5, starting at verse 4, and we're going to have to end it here, so I'll pick this up next week. But in verses 4 through 6, he starts talking about the requirements. Because God places requirements not only on the giver, but also on the one receiving. And remember he said, make sure that you're giving to widows indeed. So there, there is discretion, there is guidelines in our giving to the poor. And so next Thursday night, we'll go through the rest of this chapter and talk about what those guidelines are. Because we don't just walk down the street throwing up big handfuls of money. It's not done that way. It's done deliberately. It's done with purpose. It's done by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for this time in your word. And Father, we see very clearly that you expect us to be generous just as you have been so generous with us. And you've given us so far more than what we deserve. Father, I pray that you would soften our hearts. Make it impossible for us to pass someone in need without doing something. We are to be the salt and the light of the world. But if we become the priest or the Levite who just passes by on the other side of the street, we're no longer salt and light. We're good for nothing. If we're not touching another life, we're good for nothing. So Father, just like you reach down out of heaven and grab hold of us in our deepest need, we pray that we would be able to demonstrate that love as, as we have freely received, help us to freely give. And Father, when we get hurt, when we get bruised, when there are times when a swine does turn around and rend us, we pray that you would give us the capacity to forgive, to have compassion, and to go out and give again. So Father, as we go, we commit this night to you and we ask that you would bring us back Sunday safely to worship you. I pray for your peace to be upon every heart every household here in this room tonight. We lift up Tricia to you. She leaves tomorrow to go to L.A. for a very important conference. And Father, we ask for your protection. We pray that you would give her wisdom and the words to speak. Bring her home back safely, we ask. And we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.